Welcome to all our viewers and listeners to our panel discussion today. Today, we are going to explore how Western-based foreign direct investment in developing and emerging economies can be better connected to local opportunities and therefore also be used as tools towards global economic and social progress. We have with us today a, a fantastic panel of really experienced folks in the subject matter, uh, actually really a truly global representation. Um, so this is gonna be an exciting conversation. I'd like each of our panelists to just very quickly um, introduce themselves, uh, name, company, and quickly sort of their orientation about how they come to this conversation. And then we'll we'll kick off from there. So I'm just gonna kind of run through my cubes here and I'm gonna start with Carl, start with you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I'm Carl Malloy and I work for Visa, the CMEA region, as a head of social impact uh, for the region. And I really come from to this conversation from a perspective of skills and development being a critical uh, part of strengthening small and medium businesses um, in Africa and the rest of the world. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Eddie. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Eddie Marshall uh, from Denton. I run our global family office practice. and happy to be here with my colleague, Jeff. Um, I come to this group working with family offices and, and allocators uh, to emerging markets uh, and excited about today's conversation. Fantastic. Thank you. Linda, can you can you hear us? Can you uh, reconnect? Or not? Well, yes, perfect. I'm here. So good afternoon, I'm Linda Finguesi, and I'm the founder of a capacity building firm called Kaizen, based in London and in Ivory Coast. I come into this conversation, obviously, to talk about the impact of the uh, FDIs on SMEs, but also because of the background that I've had as an investment banker. So thank you. Fantastic. Great. Aisha. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and to Dentons. Uh, it's great to be here at Concordia and to be part of this discussion. I'm Aisha Khanna, head of CARE Enterprises, which serves at, as CARE's impact investment arm. So CARE is an international development and social justice organization that operates in 100 countries around the world. And I come to this conversation because at CARE Enterprises, we're working to tap into markets and to leverage philanthropy and mission-aligned investments to attract commercial capital to invest in small businesses in developing countries with the gender lens. Uh, but it's good to be with you all. Thank you. And and we have, the Dens have had the, really the privilege of getting to work with CARE in a number of big projects, particularly Aisha, um, currently. Okay, so next, uh, uh, Dupac, Deepak, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear or see me. I have a few technical problems, but just a, a quick introduction. I'm Deepak Mishra. I'm the president of the Americas region for Philip Morris International. Uh, in that capacity and my prior roles, I've overseen a number of investment decisions that we've made in support of our smoke-free future, which I'd be happy to talk about uh, across the world. Delighted to be here. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anyway, yes, we can we can definitely hear you, so thank you. And last but not least, Welby. Or last and least, uh, maybe. But uh, I'm Welby Lehman with Walmart, and... Um, I just took a new challenge at the company after uh, six and a half years of doing Latin American uh, government affairs uh, to really sort of ha having recognized that in that context, a lot of the things we're going to talk about are, are sort of uh, big policy solutions waiting to happen. Uh, I'm uh, now working on setting up uh, sort of an, uh, an incubation process to, to try to design in a very collaborative way across stakeholders, policy solutions that can be valuable um, uh, to our stakeholders and to the company. And um, you know, I'm also drawing upon earlier work in the FDI space in that early in my career, the UN Development Program put me into the Peruvian government's investment promotion agency. And then uh, from there, I ended up in the US government and, and helped um, uh, coordinate the issuance of the CFIUS regulations of 2007, which were about foreign investment. So I've sort of been on both sides of the table, and I'm hoping to uh, make those less sides uh, and more uh, collaboration space. Well, you certainly be up circulated all around this conversation, and, and I may need to confer with you. Uh, you know, get your advice around the CFIUS compliance. Um, 
it's you've made a good uh, a good opportunity for a, a full employment lawyers act in that regard. So we won't go into that right now. So anyhow, let me uh, set the table, and kick off our our discussion, um, and start with um, some statistics that came out in Global Finance Magazine earlier this year that talked about 2020. And it talked about how, uh, for instance, foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean was down last year, almost 45 percent. Uh, Africa down approximately 16 percent. Russia, which actually is is kind of found in this category currently, uh, down 60 percent. So in the article, they, they talk about how this bodes, you know, quite ill for emerging and developing economies. Nonetheless, uh, recently in a Bloomberg article, actually just from last month, you know, they talk about it's more likely that growth, earnings growth in emerging markets will far outpace the U.S. in the years to come. So here you have some very different opinions. Of course, this is typical for COVID. You know, the world is ending and then everybody makes more money. So, uh, but, you know, in that, you know, Deepak, you know, why all the optimism, you know, for emerging markets right now? Uh, in our business, uh, what we're trying to do, uh, Jeff, is uh, we, we are the uh, largest publicly traded uh, tobacco company, but we are trying to shift away from cigarettes. We're transitioning our business away from cigarettes to better alternatives for consumers that are backed by science. And uh, these products have become, over the last five years, 30% of our revenues. We've declared publicly that uh, we want uh, these products to become 50% of our revenues or greater by 2025. And in uh, that transformation that we've been uh, driving together with both our colleagues and with governments from across the world, uh, we've, uh, of course, uh, invested significantly uh, in R&D, in manufacturing, in IP, in 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 uh, in patents, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, and not patents, just in uh, developed uh, markets, in, but also uh, significantly markets, in non OECD markets, as we seek to change the lives of uh, of smokers across the world. And uh, that's something that we're seeing a uh, significant interest in, uh, both from uh, certainly from consumers, but also from governments. And we look forward to partnering with governments to push that agenda. Great. And, and Carl, what are, what are you hearing as far as the optimism for an investment in these developing and emerging markets? The optimism will come from making sure that SMBs across the uh, developing market actually rebound. Um, these, um, if, we, if we manage to strengthen the skills of SMBs, if we manage to get them access to digital financial services and they can actually improve the way they sell and the way they get paid, you can start to see and track the flows of, the, of, the, of what they are selling, which is an important starting point for any investor. So, of course, we're looking at the small, um, small and medium businesses, but they represent the majority of enterprises around the world being in developing market, but also developed market. And of course, they've been hit by the pandemic. But there is actually a, a case to be made to how do we strengthen these entities, many, many of them led by women, so that we have stronger, resilient economies that rebound. So um, the optimism comes from the fact that we may have lost some businesses, but there's already actually a growth in the number of online transactions and e-commerce that we see, which definitely gives us uh, enough data that suggests that consumers are also changing their habits to support SMBs, which is very critical. And Visa, of course, and plays an important role in that. Yes, Jeff. Just so, just so our listeners, uh, SMBs means... Oh, sorry. Uh, small and medium businesses. And if we do MSMBs and we're talking about micro, small and medium businesses, I'll drop Great. the acronym, I, promise. Yes, no, no, it's okay. I mean, most people here, I'm sure. I just want to make sure everyone keeps up. I, I want to take a quick tangent on this topic because I think, Carl, you raised a, a point that's near and dear to a couple of us on this call and is the importance of women-owned businesses. And we are really lucky as we take this tangent to have a real expert on that topic and Aisha and the work that she's doing. And I, if you could just help us elaborate a little bit on really the statistical support for that concept, because I want that to want our listeners to really <clears throat> log that away and think about that. One of the things they take away from this conversation. No, thank you, Jeff. I, 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 absolutely. At Care and Care Enterprises, we see, uh, Carl, to your point, a big 
a significant opportunity to address economic and social progress through a gender strategy. And from CARE's perspective, an ability to execute on that because we're better connected to these local, local contexts is because of our footprint and our experience. Um, so there is um, the fund that we've launched at CARE is a blended finance fund called the CARE She Trades Impact Fund. It's focused on South and Southeast Asia. And um, we are so encouraged because we have uh, been doing diligence on hundreds of small businesses. And despite the challenges of this pandemic, they are nimble, many are tech enabled, um, they are resilient, they're ready to take on capital for growth. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is getting that capital to them and, um, and focusing, we believe, on women's economic empowerment as an economic engine. Um, so um, there's about 190 nine billion dollar financing gap in South and Southeast Asia for women businesses. Um, so a big opportunity to address that market gap and get capital to women founders of businesses, to businesses that have a lot of women workers and consumers to lift up and really build back better as we rebound from uh, this pandemic. So we're seeing the significant opportunity. Um, we, we, because CARE has um, it, nationals on the ground in country offices, um, we know these businesses um, and they're ready for investment. Uh, but the challenge is how do we accelerate uh, getting capital to the ground and really make these investments? But the, the markets are there and the businesses are there. Um, and the opportunity is there for sure. And we believe it's only through women's economic empowerment that we're going to address these significant crises that we're facing from poverty to COVID to climate change. That's great. Thank, and thank you for d diving in on that topic for us because, and, and Carl, thanks for prompting me to, to get in that direction. I was gonna be looking for an opening, and I'm glad we were able to do that. So let me pivot off, actually, you, you, you used the term that I <clears throat> wanna talk about. There was <clears throat> actually an article in Forbes, I think two weeks ago, where they were talking about an emerging and developing economies, and they used the phrase, you know, the phrase sort of adaptability and nimbleness, and, and I'll actually read a section of it talked about Let's see, it says, you know, over the past several months, emerging market countries showed economic resilience in areas where the Western counterparts have faltered in part, while many American and Canadian manufacturers struggled throughout the pandemic. Um, many of the emerging markets excelled in their manufacturing capabilities. So the you know, question I have is we're, we're thinking about this and again, thinking about these descriptors for these markets, you know, what, what in particular in a region makes it in an emerging and developing market makes it attractable attractive for foreign direct investment you know well be let me ask you so is it just resilience and nimbleness or what makes that market attractive for walmart yeah you know the at the core um what makes a market attractive is having stakeholders who have needs dreams be done in order to accomplish them uh and a government that's committed to helping citizens and, and all sorts of stakeholders accomplish their dreams and, and needs, uh, uh, because that's, that's business. Uh, and it's business in cooperation with other sectors. So, um, you know, I, I do think that in the emerging markets, um, and in emerging parts of, of, uh, um, and, 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 um, uh, areas of developed economies that are are in need of or are, are in reinvigorating, uh, there is so much open space for this sort of of satisfying of the jobs to be done across many different stakeholders. Um, one thing, though, that companies are going to look for is whether governments are genuinely committed to that. And one sort of shorthand for figuring that out is how committed um, policymakers are to rule of law. And anti-corruption, uh, because uh, at its core, anti-corruption uh, is sort of a diversion away from that core job that we all have uh, to satisfy people's needs and dreams. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I think that in the rule of law context, I drill down even one step further and say what we especially look for in the rule of law space is an understanding 
an appetite among both the citizenry, stakeholders across the board, and governments, that you can't accomplish a uh, rule of law for business or for citizens, but rather with. Uh, and um, that, that's sort of the core difference between uh, economies and countries that in the end uh, have real potential and will emerge uh, and those that won't. Um, and uh, there are both classes. Uh, so, uh, you know, we lo love to call this sustain, since we're, you know, in a US, UN General Assembly context, I'll just mention, we love to call this sustainable development goal number 33. Of course, there are only 17 uh, sustainable development goals, uh, but 33 is what you get when you combine Number 16, with this, which is this idea of strong institutions for development, with number 17, which is a recognition of the need, the irreplaceable need of partnerships for the goals. Uh, so I think that's the critical thing. And then I'll dive down just one more level to say that in government's understanding of that, they also need to, re uh, policymakers need to understand with business that the full political geography matters. You can't have foreign direct investment if the only thing that's improved is like a subset of federal government agencies and all the subnational level hasn't changed. If you can't get the final permit, you might as well not have gotten the first permit uh, in order to get the groundbreaking going and the jobs created. So that's I would say that's the the center of what we're looking for. I think that's a, a incredible answer, a very insightful. I think most people would have expected things like you know stable currency and infrastructure and but you're right you're going back to the root of how do you get those things and um you know an, an effective government that is looking after its citizens right? uh, and, and and therefore promoting the rule of law that's that's a great answer linda i'd be interested in your your thoughts about this topic about what makes a a region attractive for foreign direct investment what are you hearing from your clients well, I'm actually going to echo what has just been said, because to me, the political will has a, a major part to play with this. If you do not have any uh, root concerns about the development of your citizens, you can have the major investment happening and uh, developing into your countries, but it's not going to have an impact into the population. Therefore, in my view, what makes the region really attractive, it is that will. It's their will to recenter the people and put them at the forefront of the activities that are going to be conducted to essentially make sure that the benefits will then be to the local communities and developing as well the local content at some stage. So it's about setting up a partnership. Once you have the will where you know that at the end of a certain time frame, it will come back to the citizens themselves that will allows you to ensure that you have the needed investment, but also that investment is sustainable at some point. In my view, that is the essence. We, we can talk about in length about the infrastructure, the market size, the area, all the things that we know about, but essentially it's, it's the will to develop the nation and the people that would obviously attract the, 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 the investments. So I'm gonna, uh, I, I, I am really excited about the, the conversation has gone in this direction. I, I didn't quite expect it, but this is great. And that I want to take some things I was going to talk about a little bit out of order, because right now we're looking at kind of the lens about what's the emerging market and the developing economy. You know, what is their issue? But I want to flip it around now. And actually, uh, Aisha gave me some thoughts around this as well. But so this brings me and my, I start thinking about, OK, as an investor, as a, you know, involved in it, all of our, you know, we all have our ESG goals, right? Or, or, or we're trying to come up with them, or we're trying to understand what it is to have an ESG goal. There's a lot of conversation around this. And so how does then this idea of this, which is we'll, we'll encapsulate all of this in kind of a embracing of the rule of law by the, by the region, by the country, how is this thinking then go into you as investors in how you fulfill your ESG responsibilities and then further, um, this idea of this then brings us into uh, this really one of the themes of the whole uh, summit here about how does this public-private partnership allow them to create that environment, us to you know meet our obligations, and so I'm going to you know put that out there 
And maybe I'll ask, uh, you know, Carl, for you to, to kick us off in that, that, that piece. I assume everyone's going to want to jump in on this one. Um, it's a very interesting point that you, you raise, and I'll start by the end of your question. Uh, Visa wants to enable by in next, um, we set a goal to enable in 2020 to enable 50 million SMBs. And so far we've reached 16 million. This is possible because you also have regulation that allows for the digital enablement to happen. So, and when that happens, it means that you have this invisible infrastructure that takes shape. And often we don't recognize what government do to make this infrastructure uh, actually work. Because it's not visible, it's not tangible, it's not a stadium, you don't really see it, but it exists. And I think that is a critical piece in terms of thinking about how do we reduce the carbon footprint, for example. Because if you no longer have to be able to carry cash around to make your payment, but you can do so using the means that becomes available is an important part. We know that uh, printing cash costs a lot of money to m most government around the world. And what are the implications of reducing that? And if we are able really to accelerate the process of digitization and reducing the number of banknotes that are circulating, it's an important step in that direction. So I'll let the other panelists bring in the other ESG component that uh, are relevant to this conversation. Uh, Jeff, let me, Jeff. Uh, uh, yeah, let me, um, Eddie, I was just actually going to invite you in. So one of the things I wanted to, uh, I want to add to this, because I think this is a, in a way, not really a new participant, but sort of a, a more visible new participant to this scene, are, is the family office arena, where, you know, they become a major player in the capital markets. Uh, you know, some people call them at the, you know, the equivalents or the replacements for private equity. I don't think it's a replacement. But really, Eddie, the, the profile investment strategies of family offices appear to be really well suited for investing in emerging markets. And so, I mean, if you could sort of either validate that or not, but also I know this conversation around ESG also means a lot to many of these family offices. It, it does. And, and, and Linda's comments, you know, really struck me as something that I think is, is critical as as families uh, and allocators to capital are increasingly getting and public companies as well are getting increasingly scrutinized as how are they meeting ESG goals? How are they implementing through their activities, whether it's large asset managers making that uh, you know, ratings of of these types of companies or. Uh, uh, other folks that have at large institutions and endowments, you know, having a requirement uh, and building that lens uh, of ESG, I, I think it's a very uh, applicable piece and it, and it builds to the sustainability that all the participants talked about uh, when you're looking at uh, emerging markets and, and for that. The family offices are certainly have a lot of similar characteristics to large institutional capital. And I think part of what's missing in, in, in markets like in Africa is large uh, developed private equity and venture capital markets. And I think you get a lot of that through private uh, private business owners and private investors, ergo family offices. Uh, and I think that becomes a, a big place where they can have it because one of the things that they have uh, that fits on their side of the, the, uh, of the scale is time. Uh, people call it patient capital, but I, I think they, they prefer to call it time agnostic capital. And I think that, uh, that presents some, a, a tremendous amounts of opportunities uh, because these are not going to be investments that are going to turn in, in a couple of years. It may take a decade uh, on, on things that are larger and just having that patience, uh, just as any multinational corporation would be to going into an emerging market, you've got to have that patience that you're going into it. And I think it, the tides are shifting a little bit. It's moving away from uh, where families looked at emerging markets as maybe something on the impact investing side or philanthropic efforts. Uh, uh, certainly the Walton family is very uh, philanthropic and, and it's very uh, strong in this area, but it, it's shifted towards more traditional investing. Uh, and, I, and we're seeing a lot of uh, participants from Europe, uh, from Asia, Middle East, look at it places like Africa to do that. And you're getting more sophistication in the family office arena. It's less tied to a family business and, and almost emerging as its own type of capital allocator class uh, in these areas as well. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting piece. Uh, 
there is a significant portion of families that are looking at ESG as an important element to their investments and to their investments in that area. And uh, both those seeking capital and allocating capital are uh, would be would be uh, you know benefit from knowing and understanding how family offices work. Yeah, I think one one I think it's fascinating that family offices. You know, they, you know, you're talking about a very small group of people who are deciding what success looks like to them. So maybe they want a return, but, you know, they're willing to have a, a smaller return because they like the idea of this. They like the idea of, you know, care she trades fund and what it's trying to accomplish. And so it's OK, but they'll bring their discipline of their money to to the cause as well. And I think the challenge, again, we'll just we'll stick one sec more second on the family office is it's easy, it's harder to find you know there's not the the market of family offices and everyone knows here it's a it's a lot of as eddie well knows it's a lot of really digging it out and finding where these folks are they don't often want to advertise you know they're there and so it's much more difficult than you know trying to find private equity funds or venture funds or strategic you know uh, corporate funds um so i think there's trying to match those things together is is the challenge of of, of this opportunity well, let's let's. Uh, I want to stay on the topic because I, again, I, I see everyone sort of chomping to want to have a conversation about it. But, so feel free to, to sort of go ahead and jump in. I don't want to hold anyone back. Jeff, it, it's Aisha, and I, I just wanted to touch on the scale of the challenge that we're talking about here. So, you know, the world has a $1.5 trillion annual capital gap to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Um, so their uh, aid, you know, aid is not going to get us there. The $150 billion in aid is not going to get us anywhere near there. So I think there's a recognition that uh, we've got to activate the markets and use new kinds of models like blended finance impact funds and leveraging philanthropy and aid to be catalytic to attract the private sector. Um, uh, new models like institutions, capital allocators, pooling funds with a clear mandate and putting in rapid uh, deployment mechanisms uh, to meet the moment uh, instead of relying on the traditional processes that we have in place that can be very bureaucratic. Um, one of the ironies, I think, in this pandemic is that because it has disrupted the typical way that institutions and capital allocators can conduct due diligence. You can't fly in and fly out of countries. Um, the capital flows have actually slowed, to your point earlier, at a time when they're needed most. So this is a call for different kinds of partnerships. Uh, and, and certainly from CARE's perspective, it was a call to think about how do we leverage our humanitarian work we've done on the ground and the trust and the relationships that we've built and the understanding of culture um, and leverage that uh, and to bring and partner in different kinds of ways. Um, and so uh, I, I think this is a call to action for us to create new, dynamic, different kinds of partnerships to address these very complex global challenges right now if we're going to overcome the issue that you shared up front, that we're lagging in capital investments. We can't keep doing it the same way that we've done it, and institutions are always slow to change. How do we revamp uh, the way um, that we make decisions um, that, and how do we deploy the capital. Another example I would just share is 15 governments have come together um, to commit to the 2X gender challenge and invest $4.3 billion with a gender lens in small businesses around the world, but a very small fraction of that has been deployed. Um, and this is now we're a year and a half into this pandemic. So how do we accelerate this and how do we work uh, with corporations and foundations and NGOs and entrepreneurs and governments to reduce the bureaucratic delays um, the, and begin making investments in developing countries at a different type of pace and partner in different ways uh, to get the capital to the ground where it's needed most. And I think that's the call to action for, for all of us. I should, Jeff, um, it's Linda. I, I actually agree with the fact where you talked about the, the dynamics that we need to change and the models and finding new partnerships. And it's important to obviously reiterate the fact that we need to 
create an ecosystem where SMEs, who obviously represent the larger portion that the funding is going to, are going to go to, become more resilient and are obviously accelerated with a human capital development that is efficient and that is obviously going to be able to absorb these fundings and develop a sustainable um, company, a sustainable market as a whole. So not only do we need to change the, the dynamics and the models, the financing models, but we definitely need to call for action in terms of governments or any investors to ensure that a collaboration is done not only with multinational, but with also a different ecosystem that would allow various emerging countries yeah. to keep growing. I think it's a key element as well. Uh, yeah, I'm very encouraged by uh, uh, my co-panelists' comments in that, you know, what I hear is a strong pronunciation of the silent D in ESG. Uh, the, uh, the ESG needs to be understood in the context of development, uh, the context of sustainable development goals. Um, and... Um, that means uh, uh, all of the things that have been emphasized, as well as a challenge to ensure that our model of going out E is reinforcing inclusion rather than exacerbating a sort of popular elite divide at the values level or at the sort of operational and systemic power mm -hmm. levels. Uh, and so uh, that's why this a um, uh, point that Linda and others uh, just hit on collaboration is both important in getting the details of everything we do right, uh, because, of course, diversity and, and, and inclusion are central to that. But in addition, it has a meta value, uh, which is that it addresses um, uh, development in a way that solves for some of the um, uh, biggest problems within both S and D that we have. Uh, um, so uh, so I, I am so pleased to hear this sort of like, a, you know, just uh, thundering through in, in the messaging. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad to talk about sort of what we think that looks like in practical de detail on the ground with regards to some of our um, ESG work. Um, uh, you know, I can, I can uh, in some ways, report really positive traction on taking what has been in some areas, for example, uh, you know, I mentioned rule of law earlier, um, a, uh, a disempowering vicious cycle in uh, key markets in which we operate, including Central America, that looks like it's starting to turn the corner in favor of a model that may be highly inclusive uh, and that um, as a result, may start uh, generating a virtuous cycle in which every improvement we have on rule of law facilitates more uh, investment in underserved communities, more inclusion in supply chain that further pushes out the envelope of commitment to rule of law and high compliance standards and keeps the, keeps the circle going. So uh, I, I do think that there's so much at stake here that we are in crisis across the entire E and S and G. Right. Right. Uh, and that um, uh, we can make progress. I want to I want to start talking about some yeah some of these specific examples. But first, I want to uh, call on Deepak to to round out our conversation on this sort of broader uh, uh, talk here. So you're on mute. I'm sorry, D Deepak. You're on mute. I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thanks to uh, all my four panelists. I can only uh, violently agree with everything that's been said here. Uh, at Philip Morris International, I mean, we uh, have, of course, a very, very strong commitment to uh, a number of S SDGs, which are fundamental and, and embedded within our transformation. Uh, we really start with our product, our smoke-free products, which by virtue of uh, of replacing cigarettes, which they have started doing extremely aggressively across the world, uh, are uh, are helping millions of smokers lead more sustainable lives. We have a significant action on climate change and have zero carbon targets that we are well on our way to meeting. Uh, we, of course, uh, uh, a number of farmers across the world uh, of tobacco leaf and other agricultural products we use depend on us. 
as cigarettes go away and the products that replace them do not use that much tobacco, uh, their livelihoods are at stake. So we work with them quite significantly to find them alternate crops that they can diversify their operations on. Uh, and uh, we do all of these in in uh, collaboration, certainly in uh, in markets that we play in and operate in and grow things in uh, in quite close collaboration with the with the relevant governments, uh, where we employ thousands of people and have uh, further thousands of people dependent in some way on our business. I do have to say though that I mean I, I can only agree massively with uh, with what Mr. Lehman said, and that's certainly our observation that. Uh, when we go through transitions like the ones that we're trying to go through here, uh, the nature of, uh, of of the government's approach towards being forward thinking on enabling that regulatory environment is absolutely key. And it goes back to many of the root causes that you talked about. But we've seen a, a massive difference in governments that actually have a positive outlook towards harm reduction and then work with the industry to enable that. U.S. being one of them, with uh, with the Food and Drug Administration uh, putting in place really the model regulatory framework for nicotine products uh, to ensure that products are scientifically validated to be appropriate for public health uh, are able to be on the market, and those that are not will not. And that's the type of outcome that we're trying to actually uh, work with governments across the world to get to. So that's a good segue. So those are some good examples because again, I, I want to drill down a little bit more on, you know, from an investor's perspective, there are clear risk factors uh, in in entering into or continuing to invest in these markets, which are also there. In the flip side, are challenges that those markets are facing. Things like you know, political risk and legal risk and currency risk and health risk and inflation. Da da da. da goes on and on. Uh, and this this also syncs up with a question that we got from one of our uh, 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 participants here about you know what are the blind spots that you are seeing that 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 governments are failing to adapt to or recognize as they're trying to you know think about to, how, how to you know raise up these opportunities. But similarly, again, getting into what are the the joint projects that private sector and public sector can work on? And what are maybe some examples? What are your businesses doing? Even better, what have you seen other people doing that you think represent best practices or a good trend? Let me ask, start with you, Carl. Since Thank you. Um, I think one of these interesting examples has been the delivery of um, funds to communities across different countries that was done by government to allow individuals and communities that are suffering from the fact that the activities were stopped due to physical distancing measures to preserve life and to maintain livelihoods. So you have the very strong collaboration between the private and the public sector in ensuring that um, they get a, they, they, the money on the visa card or they get it on a on the digital platform. And that has also helped the acceleration and realization of government that digital is not just something nice to have, but it's an important enabler of inclusion and equity in our communities. So I think that is that is important. And then when we think about rebuilding, if you think about the African continent and the fact that governments have agreed to create the African continental free trade area, which is probably one of the most ambitious projects that has ever been undertaken on, on this continent, where you're asking 55 member states of the African Union to agree on one policy framework. This implies that from an investment perspective, you can look at 1.3 billion people at the moment, whereas before, you're looking at 54 different markets. And the fragmentation of this market implies that you cannot take full advantage of it. One implications of that is how do we make sure that all these different governments think about cross-border payments again? For an SMB which is sitting in, let's say, Cape Verde that is trying to sell something in, in Lesotho or in Pakistan to make sure that they can actually make those payments. So I think what the pandemic has allowed us to realize is that we need that um, stronger bond in between institutions, individuals, and communities. If we were able to deliver that for re for relief packages that used to be in the past probably an airplane dropping food, we realized that by giving a card to somebody, you give them the opportunity to buy what they need at that particular point in time. And that has been government that have pushed for these things to happen. So it is possible. 
And I think there are many more examples that we can think of in, in that in that space. So a good a good a good complement to care packages, which what uh, Aisha what the seventy fifth anniversary I think of the I can't remember what, is, what you all just saw. Yeah, seventy fifth yeah. year, <laughs> right? It's good. I remembered something. There you go. <laughs> of the care package, which of course uh, um, is a tremendous um, relief effort in in the outset. So. Uh, let me ask any other uh, suggested uh, things that you all are seeing in the market, again, either that your companies are doing or that you've witnessed um, others doing that seem to be really having an impact in, in partnering with the public sector. Jeff, well, you reference. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I jump, I jump. Sorry, Jeff. I was just going to, I was just going to dive in uh, to say that um, care has recognized that, we have an opportunity to build on the relationships and uh, that uh, we have in place around the world where we've been advocating for new policies, where we've been working on the ground with citizens, building nonprofit coalitions, uh, you know, working with large companies. Um, our strategy has been how do we build on all of that understanding of the local regulations, uh, laws, opportunities, and um, uh, replicate an impact fund where care has that footprint and has those relationships and some of the infrastructure that's in place. Um, so, so one of our great learnings, and we're just at the beginning of this, and we're building a new muscle here, um, and we're starting in South and Southeast Asia, but one of the learnings to other panelists' points is that um, how do we leverage in a more holistic way um, all the different elements of communities and understand that it takes it all. Um, and for care, um, we are building the market side. And, and so that requires partnerships with the private sector. Uh, so just a quick example is that we've partnered with Bamboo Capital Partners. They're an, an impact fund manager. And we've partnered with the UN and World Trade Agency, the International Trade Center, to launch this gender impact fund. So we bring different assets to the table. Care has an understanding of the culture and the impact side. And so in addition to um, addressing critical financing needs, care staff on the ground will be working side by side with these businesses. And Linda, to your point earlier that you're making, which is we've got to build the capacity of these businesses so that they can grow and expand. Um, so this is a new model for us to meet critical financing needs of, of, of a pipeline of small businesses. It, it also, though, reduces the risks. Many financial institutions don't lend to small businesses in developing countries. They're lending to intermediaries like microfinance and other financial institutions. They're lending to large companies um, because they have a lower risk appetite and they have much more stringent requirements. So we have discovered, and a key asset of CARE is that we, because we have a local investment team in Singapore through Bamboo and all these decades of experience that CARE has in working in these emerging markets in the ground, we're comfortable with absorbing this additional risk and being more flexible with, with our requirements because we know what healthy growing companies look like on the ground and we're confident we can build this pipeline. So um, we are working to reduce the risk because of our presence on the ground, which has been one of the barriers and friction uh, to financial institutions to make this investment. So it's just, I just wanted to share that example and, and Denton is bringing their global expertise to help us navigate the legal and regulatory challenges at scale as well. But it has required a different kind of partnership and operating in a totally different way. And frankly, CARE has had to work differently. CARE Enterprises is a separate subsidiary. We have an independent board. We're much more nimble to be able to work across CARE and work directly with our country offices. So CARE has had to also learn how we have to adjust uh, and be more nimble to take advantage of these opportunities. So it, I just wanted to share that example because it's a great learning uh, for us and we hope we might be able to uh, replicate this as we as we move forward i think one important thing for everyone to sort of think about and note there is sort of the, the fact that you re-engineered a little bit about how you typically go to market in order to to hopefully be which you, you will be more effective and that's an interesting thought that that people maybe necessarily companies can't think about it doing it the same way they always do it, uh, that this requires a, a bespoke approach. Sorry, Linda, I interrupt you. Yes, um, it's, it's, it, it, we had interesting times with the pandemic that we've had as well. And in terms of um, 
operating with the government, what we've seen is, uh, as we alluded to earlier on, we've had some funds being made available by the government to, uh, to larger companies and to SMEs. So as far as we were concerned, I talk about, again, the human capital development. It was key for us to develop the ecosystem that we belong to to ensure that should anything like this happen again, we have more resilient SMEs that are able to resist and not obviously close their doors. So for us, it was mainly to create a set of um, training tools to build those SMEs to become more resilient and understand the utilization of the funds that were allocated to them. We have uh, a lot of SMEs or a lot of companies within the sectors of the agriculture or the commodities where you have the people working that are not fully literate. So it was important to create a way whereby they would understand the utilization of these funds that are given by the government to ensure that a business stay afloat and should any any situation like this or any stress test like that happen again, we were able to ensure that we resisted. So you were asking about sharing how we made sure that these uh, interactions with the government ensure that businesses stay afloat. This is as far as we were concerned what we did uh, to again have an ecosystem that is fully trained and know how to optimize. Earlier on, Aisha was talking about the risk appetite and the financing of firms. We are more likely to lend to a microfinance who will then obviously assess the market and lend uh, in return to any SMEs. But that lending can only be happening if the company benefiting from these funds is fully trained and know exactly what they're doing. And it's essential that we point that out there. That's, uh, yeah, it's really Welby. I know you 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 were already teasing us that you had some thoughts here, so let's let's hear it. Well, well uh, the great thing is that the, the main takeaway from what I what I could say um, uh, about the example I teased it has already been well made out. In that, the key is to recognize um, to keep your eye on stakeholders um, and to recognize that their needs don't fit neatly. Uh, in a stovepipe way into, let's say, one SDG point one, point two, and so forth. Uh, and yet that's how we do policy as a general matter in capitals and in organizations. Uh, and so, you know, COVID has been the ultimate example of that. Uh, nobody can any more doubt that, you know, SDG three good health is its own little thing uh, and doesn't relate to, let's say, inequality, poverty, hunger, and so many other things, uh, strong institutions. Um, and so, uh, in that context, I'll, I'll use a specific example that Walmart's uh, been working on in, I think, a holistic way, which means we're not working on it. It's a big group that we're working with on it. Um, and um, uh, it arises from the importance of addressing the root causes of migration. Um, the ultimate root cause, of course, of, of migration from Central America, uh, uh, from other uh, places, is uh, hope, hope for a better life. Um, and uh, that's a pretty holistic idea. And yet the historical way in which, or the, his, the way that we have historically worked um, is for um, those interested in the root causes of migration to say, okay, what we need from businesses is to put investment in underserved communities so that both investment and jobs are uh, in places where people most need them, and to integrate the underincluded in supply chains, both domestic suppliers in general and MSMEs. Uh, and, um, and then, uh, of course, uh, we also need to address that other root cause of, uh, of, of emigration from areas with which is weak rule of law and insecurity. Um, uh, as it turns out, there's a vicious cycle between those two. It's very unlikely for businesses to be able to integrate into supply chains in areas or in, in contexts, political and economic contexts, in which there's little trust and little reason to trust uh, um, uh, other actors in an ecosystem. So rule of law creates a chicken and egg problem with the one of the core things that businesses are being asked to do to address root causes of migration. Uh, um, and 
then similarly, it's difficult to get investment into underserved communities if these sort of institutional structures there don't allow for the regulatory action to be done in both a predictable and fair way. Um, and so uh, fair, fair to all stakeholders. Uh, and so as a result, the vicious cycle has long existed between uh, the two key root causes of migration, uh, um, one of which is a, a need for more inclusive economic opportunity and the other a greater rule of law um, and trust, um, needs to be reversed somehow. That cannot be reversed by our simply standing in those two corners to which our different sectors have been assigned, telling the other to get with it and do more work on their side. Rather, we need to collapse those stovepipes. And to um, it, when we do, what we see is that there are specific rule of law issues that could be early sort of low-hanging fruit that if we start showing improvement there, it improves trust and economic opportunity simultaneously. So let's look at the investment cycle and notice that for example, one of those areas, for example, is digital tools brought to licensing and permitting systems. Why? Well, because licensing and permitting is about investment that is highly ripened. It has gone through the investment review. It is ready for groundbreaking. If you can shorten a licensing and permitting process or make it more, more predictable and fair, uh, will get investment very quickly. Uh, that builds trust because you start to see results. Um, the political economy improves. Um, but that means that businesses are going to need to um, be uh, um, recognize their own role in building out that public good of digital capacity uh, in, in uh, communities because digital is can be expensive and it is certainly technically demanding. And so it requires us to step up and say, we are not just going to build out digital um, uh, models, thinking about, let's say, only the bottom line, uh, or for that matter, only uh, um, uh, sort of the, the places in which we already have highly digital um, uh, stakeholders. We are going to uh, recognize digital as a as a key need in the places uh, that are most underserved. That means as you build out uh, digital capacity and regulatory systems, you're gonna need inclusion interventions at every stage. So what's the difference between, let's say, a digital licensing and permitting system that's accessible only on, let's say, a fancy MacBook Pro with lots of uh, 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 power versus a, uh, sim a slimmed down mobile device? The difference is inclusion. Uh, and so uh, those are the types of things that because we have stakeholders that whose jobs and needs we're trying to satisfy, we're attuned to them as our NGOs from other perspectives, as are the best of government policymakers. We need to work together, share that, make sure we get the technicals right, uh, because we're building out uh, hope. And uh, as we do that, um, uh, we have found in this agenda that, that we're partnering on in several multilateral forums with a lot of businesses, uh, early adopter governments, um, and NGOs, that this idea of digital tools for rule of law and economic rec recovery, inclusive economic recovery, is a non stovepipe holistic approach um, uh, that instead of uh, Forcing people into their into their uh, side starts to get people to feel hopeful that we'll get real um, uh, traction. That's great, Eddie Deepak. I, um, uh, this is I know you all probably have things you want to jump in here, and um, I'm pleased that we've taken up you know, the bulk of our time on this topic. So let's let's round it out. You know, it, it was very interesting to listen to Wilby, and the thing that was going through my mind was uh, was actually that. Many of the things you talked about will be come together very nicely when uh, developed developing economies go through one or more of certain uh, let's call them leapfrog transitions, which is a phrase that's been used. And I lived through a couple in prior careers. One example, which I think Carl you referred to, and I've certainly seen that in my home country in India of digital banking, when the country decided to get serious about digital banking, it got serious very fast. 
And at this point in time, uh, you know, uh, mobile payment is probably more prevalent in uh, in India than it is in the UK, which is where I'm also from. Uh, and and then, and then the second, which I've lived through a number of times, and I think many countries in, in my region are going through that right now, is energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables. And when they go through the process, they bring significant, uh, obviously, uh, hit a lot of their SDGs in terms of uh, in terms of renewable energy and sustainability. But when a developing country actually brings in renewable power, they're not just replacing what was uh, less good. They were actually adding capacity and jobs and sustainability and growing the economy. And the reason that, that struck me was because these are situations where three or four things happen very neatly if you have a forward-thinking government. The first is public sector, private sector partnerships are the way to do it because the pub private sector brings in the experience of having partnered with other governments through journeys, good and bad, and then they can bring so-called best practices, right, into how to make that happen. And I used to work for such a private sector company in the energy business, and I know the mistakes we made, and then we corrected them in the markets that we went to. The second is, by definition, and I really love your example of uh, digital tools brought to licensing, is around such a transition, you basically have to construct the regulatory framework, which does require the rule of law that is specific to that context, right? And the third is that that, that, the, that these things usually have a knock-on effect where you start one of these structural transitions, be it energy, be it clean cars, be it digital banking, and we're hoping smoke-free future, what we're trying to push is going to be one such transition in many governments. Actually bring jobs, bring investment, bring regulation, bring rule of law, hit sustainability goals, all at one shot, if done well. That, that was what was going through my mind. Fantastic. Eddie, I don't want to leave you out. Sure. No, I'd say excellent points all around. I would say one area we're also seeing is the move away from shareholder uh, profit maximization as a status uh, for in a lot of these uh, investments for these families. And I think that is something that uh, families are very attracted to. And, and that certainly involves a public-private partnership and with community organizations uh, for uh, multinationals that are coming into these groups or just uh, large uh, companies that are operating in emerging markets. A, a couple of examples, because I know we're running short on time. If folks want to check out what Oxford is, is, is partnered with the Mars family on the economics of mutuality, that's a very fascinating uh, thing. It's now gone into its own element, the impact as well. It's a group of uh, family offices looking at the impact investing before it ever became you know, something that we talk about quite often. Uh, and if anyone else wants to learn uh, more about family offices and, and, and how they're working in emerging markets and keeping all of the things in mind, just uh, please be in touch with Jeff and we'd, we'd love to, to, to be uh, a part of that conversation. But excellent conversation uh, uh, today. And I, I certainly appreciate all my co-panelists as well. You know, I, I, what I find um, interesting, and I see where this is all coming together, again, you, you make this profit maximization point, Eddie, is the transition of our, our businesses making this rather than a, a one-off community affairs, you know, civic engagement undertaking, rather a fundamental part of how we operate, that it is, it is in our DNA operationally and not a, just a nice to have community service piece of it. And I think that's where, you know, you know, all of us probably struggle organizationally as a whole organization to really change that mindset. Not that, that we don't, but it, it really does cause breaking down a lot of old fashioned ways of doing things. And, and again, as Aisha said, you know, maybe creating new models about how we approach these challenges. So, I mean, just a wonderful conversation. I am pleased we didn't get to the whole two sections. I am. I think our our listeners and viewers really benefited from the insights you all have. I'd love to package you all up together to just go out and you know start solving world problems. Um, and maybe we'll we'll work on that in the interim for next year's uh, panel discussion on these topics. I, I do want at some point to talk. You know, uh, maybe we'll figure another format or maybe next year about this idea of public sector, private sector diplomacy. I think it's fascinating. Um, we'll get some government officials on that. But I want to I really want to thank 
Concordia for uh, bringing us all together. I want to um, thank my firm, Dentons, and my two colleagues, Chris Fetzer, Chris Fetzer and Eric Tannenblatt, for really helping organize this event. This has really, I personally, has exceeded my expectations. Um, the, really, the passion and brilliance you all are bringing to this effort is really impressive. I, I feel, you know, that much better on a, a Wednesday about the world, knowing that you all are out there making it a better place. So with that, again, thank you again, and uh, wish you all a, a good rest of the week. Thank you.